Now I'd like to let our esteemed panelists introduce themselves. So if we can start at the far end and come back towards me, just let us know a little bit about who you are and where you're from. Uh, hi guys, I'm Joe from Lumo. Um, we are innovation partners with Converge, so we help uh, members of Converge with their uh, R&D tax credits, uh, funding requirements, innovation grants, um, paint and box, capital allowance, any kind of um, innovations that you guys are working on, we can help you with uh, the innovation and the tax saving side of things like that. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Govan. Uh, I've been with Accenture for a little over 12 years now, and I primarily lead the AI capability along uh, Helen and Richward, uh, we, of, we operate a group called Intelligent Automation, which is a mix of RPA and AI capabilities working together. Yeah. Hey, I'm Rich. Uh, I work with Govan and Helen at Accenture. Been there for about seven years. I run our robotics process automation uh, capability and work with clients around how they adopt um, RPA and deploy it into businesses. Hi, I'm Kev. Uh, run, I'm co-founder of Ricochet. We're solving B2B sale and SME sales problems through technology. Thanks, gents. Um, I'm Helen Waller. I head up our AI and automation service for Accenture Newcastle at our advanced technology center just down the road at Cobalt Business Park. So spend most of my time working with, with these gents here um, and alongside multiple clients, all who are looking to adopt various different flavors of automation in AI into their businesses. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to, to Helen now to do a brief presentation on AI and intelligent automation. But I just wanted to let everyone know about the sort of interactive set part of the panel. Um, if you do have any questions while the panel's going on, please just raise your hand and I'll try and get to you when there's a natural break in the answers that the guys are given. If you put your hand down, I will just assume that you no longer want to ask the question or the question has been answered. Um, so we do want interaction from everybody. Please do, if you have a question, put your hand up and we'll try and get to you as soon as possible. Fantastic. Thanks, James. So I shall keep it short and sweet, mainly because I, I don't want to uh, introduce any spoilers into any of the discussions that, that we might have. Um, but just to kind of reiterate James's point before we begin, we very much want this to be an interactive session. Um, no doubt James is going to be firing some, some tricky questions at us to, to get us started. But if there's anything that you're particularly interested in or you would like to ask as we go along, please do shout up or by all means catch any of us at the end if there's anything that you'd like to, to get into in a bit more detail. Um, but without further ado... So, aim of the game today, um, really good discussion all around, um, not just AI, but what we like to refer to as intelligent automation as well. So, the idea of how we combine um, AI technologies with automation technologies, for example, um, robotics, to really create impactful, robust business solutions. Um, and as you can see from, from the slide there, this is something that has really revolutionized a lot of the work that we do in technology over the last five years, the, the last 10 years. Um, when you start to look into this stuff, it, it's really amazing how long it's, it's actually been around in various guises. For all, a, a lot of people often refer to this as new IT. When you really start scratching the surface, a lot of these concepts have existed in technology for quite some time now. It's just that in the more recent years, they're, they're really sort of coming to fruition and becoming a lot more commonplace, which you'll, you'll hear about this morning. And, and essentially, when we're, when we're talking about AI, these are the kind of things that we mean. So these four key attributes um, pretty much hang everything together in my mind when I'm, when I'm talking to people about AI and automation. Um, the ability of, of machines to start to be able to sense and perceive the world, to be able to actually comprehend what it is that they're perceiving as well. Um, to be able to take those insights and actually produce meaningful actions. And last but by no means least, to, to start to learn, which is always quite an interesting topic that, that people tend to have quite a lot of questions on, is that's when it really starts to get into the exciting part of, of not just, you know, how do we crank the handle of AI and automation, but where does it really start to get quite clever? And as I say, it's, it's not something that is as recent as you perhaps think it is. Um, and, and a lot of people are often amazed when we start to talk about how commonplace these things are. Um, you know, even with, with my, say, friends and family at home who perhaps don't work in IT, not as familiar with technology, and, and they say, you know, well, what have you been doing at work this week? And I'll say, well, we've done some artificial intelligence and we've done some robotics. And they go, oh, 
you, you built a robot. Um, and, and then you start actually getting into the discussion of, yeah, but you do realize that you're interacting with all of these things every day. And they'll go, am I? Really? Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. And these are just some of the examples of how each, I guarantee each and every one of you in this room and all of us use at least one of these things, if not multiple of these things every day, every week. Um, and we like to, to hold these up as examples to, to really kind of bring to life the fact that these are everyday occurrences, things that we're interacting with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So without further ado, I don't want to get into too much of the detail because I certainly don't want to spoil the debate. So let's start talking about AI and the future of business. So I shall hand over to our lovely compere James to get us started. Thank you very much. Um, I think the best place to probably start uh, this morning would be, for anyone unfamiliar, what, what is it that you actually think when you think AI? What is AI for the audience? What is the... Shall I start since I've got the mic? You'll yeah. never get it off me now. <laughs> I'll just chat all day. Um, cliche, but I think it depends who you ask. Um, everybody seems to have their own interpretation of, of what, what AI truly means. Um, in a, in a broad sense, I think we would typically categorize it as, as a machine or a program or a system that is doing a task where had that task been performed by a human, it would require some level of intelligence, um, is, is often how it's defined. But in, in my mind, and certainly in, in the work that I do day to day with Accenture and our clients, I very much see it as sort of an umbrella term for um, machine learning, deep learning, robotic process automation, all of these bits and pieces that sit together, data science, for example, and analytics. Um, and I think, yeah, as I say, for me, AI is that broader term that, that covers the lot. Not sure what, what you guys think? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, um, I think of it as taking a decision-making process and automating it. So it's usually um, a specific decision-making process and gathering data around that so you can put something in and get a decision out um, and then you can either combine those together to create larger intelli intelligences or have them as standalone so for instance putting a message into a messaging app it then goes off to some AI understands that and outputs or oh, these might be gifts that you want to send along with it that kind of thing yeah I think I think I, I sort of agree with that uh, you know the other panelists, but I think for me, it's it's like the tools and technology and the wraparound of how you how you use them collaboratively and deploy them into your business. Um, so I think I think if you look at the the Netflix and the you know how does it know what you want to watch because you watch something similar, I think that's a really good way to quite easily translate a, a, a basic of AI. Um, so that, that that that's kind of how I perceive AI. But again, it's 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 the umbrella, the generic term. I think people can get very quickly lost in that. And um, people run around saying, we need AI in our business. Well, do you? Do, why do you need it? What's your, what's your problem? And then you adopt the tool. I think that's, um, that's important for me. A slightly uh, different twist on that. So basically, uh, when we think about AI, it's uh, more in terms of the actual business processes themselves, what it means to the actual data to life. And for many business processes, it's more of a collaboration between humans and machines. So if you get to think about it, um, any mission that we, any AI, for instance, that we're talking about, would need human support to sort of start training them in the beginning. So it's it's the fundamental thing is data. So you start training them, and then it's uh, humans play a pivotal role in making sure that they can scale and sustain because that's going to measure the longevity of the AI application. And in turn, what the missions do for us is they amplify our thoughts. They they provide us insights, which we generally take quite a lot of time to sift through the data and process and get those insights. So it's, it's more like they become symbiotic partners, missions complementing AI, humans and humans complementing AI, sort of. Uh, well, I think as the, the person here who probably has the least to do with AI on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, uh, and as a child of the 90s, I, I expected a, you know, a big Austrian man bringing on my door asking for Sarah Connor. But um, doing a bit of research before and looking into this, it, it, it surprised me just how quickly um, AI becomes part of our day-to-day -day life, whether it's, you know, we talk about Netflix, Amazon, Apple Watches, but even within the business world, when we're talking about um, business intelligence, how uh, we've got systems that can analyze uh, stock uh, within systems. Um, it's, it's for, for me, it's, I suppose my outlook, certainly within coming into business, is just how quickly it's become a part of day-to-day -day life and, and, and the different areas that it touches upon. And just to touch on a, on a point that you made there, Rich, that companies, it's become a bit of a buzzword and companies are thinking that they need to build 
AI. We saw that very recently with the blockchain technology. That became a very hyped up word and everyone thought they had to build some blockchain solution for their business. Is that something that you find in working with businesses that businesses are approaching you just, we need an AI product rather than we need AI to do a specific thing? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm really bad with microphone. I was never destined to be an employee by So um, I don't know if you can, I can just shout if everyone can hear me. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a problem. Um, so I think, I think that's the word problem. We, a lot of our clients, a lot of businesses that I certainly go and see, um, they, they, they kind of tell me what they want and it's like, that's, that's, not really the, that's not really the outlook on the world. What you should be saying is, what's our problem? What's our strategy? What's our goal? What's our roadmap? Where do we want to, where do we want to get to? And then you, you, you kind of adapt the tools and technologies and the, the, the strategy around that. Because um, I find that with words like AI and robotics, people run around with hammers looking for nails, and, and, and it's not the, it's not the, the, the way to go. Because um, I, I think the big thing for me with, with AI, and I think it may come up as a later question, but I'll kind of just go with it now. Um, AI is going to be awesome, and it's definitely going to revolutionize the way we do things. But I think, I think the biggest challenge for me is adoption, the adoption of AI, not just, not just how we train it and go, and go into that and all the kind of ethical background of AI, but it, you need to understand why you're doing it. Are you doing it for your users? Are you doing it for your customers? Are you doing it for your agents? Who are you, who are you doing it for? Because if they don't buy into it and if they don't come along on that journey, um, it, it just won't land. And, and people nowadays, more than any, are really sort of conscious about the data that they have and, and their personal data. So understanding that and understanding the, um, the, the sort of process. And I said it before about Netflix, people always go, oh, you know, um, Netflix, Netflix killed Blockbuster. It didn't, it, it's a myth, it didn't. It was, it was users that killed Blockbuster. People thought, I do not want to go out on a Saturday night to Blockbuster and pick up a DVD, because it's a night, or a VHS if you're my, my age, but, um, so, so users killed it, and Netflix just thought, actually, there's a better way to do this, and yes, we'll use AI, and yes, we'll use new technologies, but it was customers who decided that this was the, this was the wind of change. So I think that's the really key important bit for me, is to, is to understand, your, understand the challenge and the problem and the strategy you want to do, and how you adopt it. And if AI is part of that, and it, and it will be in the way going forward, it's, it's how do you adopt that ethically, and how do you land it with your users, uh, and your customers, and your staff. And I think just to, to, to add to that as well, and I guess continuing on your, your hammer and nail uh, analogy there, you probably have hit the nail on the head in that, you know, we see a lot of people who come to us and will say something like, I want a chatbot. And then when you start to go, okay, but, but why do you want a chatbot? To Rich's point, what is actually that business problem that you're looking to solve? You know what? The answer might be a chatbot. It might be a chatbot plus some other elements of technology. It might actually be an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so it's really trying to strip it back. And, and, and this is the, the key message that we try to land with all of our clients is step one with all of this is solve business problems and then start to look at the technologies that can help you to do that. And the, and the other kind of side that I would add to that is it, it's not always easy as well. You know, even if you've found that business problem that you want to tackle, it could may, may well mean that you need to actually do quite a significant business transformation piece to then be able to adopt the AI, the automation, and the technologies that will support it. We kind of have a, an unwritten rule in our team is that we will never automate a bad process um, because it, it just doesn't solve the problem. So sometimes you might have to think about what are your existing business processes? Are they fit for automation today? If not, how do you get them to the point that they are? And, and are they even a process that you need at all? Um, I, I, I don't know about, you, about yourselves and the organizations that you work in, but um, I think we're probably as guilty as anybody is quite often inventing a new process short term as a, as a bit of a, a need at the time and it ends up becoming, it starts as a, a stick and plaster. Five years later, everybody is still using this process and it's kind of become standard. And I think when you're right at the beginning of the journey, really try to be as critical as you can that says, you know, not only is this process suitable for automation, but do we need this process at all? You know, is it even needed? Why would we go and invest in, in tools and technology to automate something that, that's, you know, potentially outdated and could be decommissioned? So really do try to have a think about those kind of things when you, you're sort of starting on that AI and automation journey. I think that raises potentially another point with the audience, and I know with people who might be watching this later, um, when people think of of AI, they're going to be thinking maybe expensive to implement or very complicated to implement. Uh, for companies that maybe don't have the budgets to be able to go to a, a very, very large company and, and get these very useful um, processes put in place, is, 
are there ways that businesses can implement AI now? Um, Kev, you're obviously producing a, a product right now which, which helps solve a, a problem for businesses. Is there a lot of that in the marketplace? Are there lots of AI products solving lots of different problems? Or is it more you have to build one yourself? Uh, there's loads of ways of doing it. Um, one of the, I'm not an expert in AI, um, but one of the reasons I'm able to use it is because there's so much technology out there now that I can interface with. I, I've got a background in technology, I'm, I'm a developer. Um, so I can actually interact with that tech. So things like wit.ai, um, it's free to use. It's, um, it's what Facebook use, all of their messenger stuff goes through, it's natural langu language processing. Um, you can just fire information at it and train it and get information back. Obviously they're keeping your data all that kind of thing, they're using it to train their own systems, but it's a good place to start. Um, and then from there, there's, there's plenty of, of packages that you can download online and interact with. Um, so it's now an accessible tech to the non-expert. I mean, we brought experts in to make sure we're not doing ridiculous things with this tech and that we're not fundamentally making mistakes at the beginning. Um, so with a small amount of education and a background in tech, you can get access to AI, um, and that's only going to get easier. The businesses are, are going to be able to, without any techno technological background, be able to interface with AI and just put their data in and get information out. Uh, that was a very interesting point uh, on the data, right? So the, the thing, exactly as he was mentioning, um, most of the cloud service providers, the way that it's moving now is if you get the cloud, they provide you all of this AI frameworks, so pretty much like free of cost. You can train models, you can you can get the immediate output. There is this bit about the data, but some of them do offer on-premise installation as well. So they can put things in your place so that you don't have to send the data out. So it becomes more easier in that sense of getting access to the whole technology. And one of the reasons why you see a major surge in AI trends at this point in time is number one, data. Uh, you'd be surprised to know that 90% of the data that exists out there has been put out there in the last two years. It's, it's us who are creating the data, and this is what is driving the uh, surge in AI applications, because the fundamental thing is the data. And uh, there are companies who source data for different problems. For instance, if you have to build a traffic system where you want to identify cars and everything else, there are companies which go out and sell images of them. Um, there are companies which uh, provide frameworks. There are companies which provide uh, NLP techniques. There, there's a wide range of uh, things in the ecosystem that we can really leverage. Depends on who looks at it, whether it's a startup trying to build a product, whether it's an organization trying to embrace AI. Uh, it, it caters to every single thing that's there. It's, it's widely being um, increasing at a very huge scale. If I could just kind of uh, go from it from a cost angle, um, a lot of people think when it comes to um, claiming money back from HMRC on the R&D tax credit side, I think it's a creating a new technology, but actually you can claim money back from HMRC where you are um, bespoking a technology to your specific requirements. So when you talk about costs, there are elements where money can be, you know, you can reduce the cost by claiming money back through uh, bespoking your solutions and um, evidencing that. I think just the final point for me is um, obviously, you know, things are expensive, um, you know, margin and revenue is critical for, for, for all businesses, but don't be afraid to fail. You know, it, it's gonna, like, it's a bumpy road. Like, there's, there's no solution. I think that certainly me and Govind have worked together on a lot. You, you, you have to try things and you will naturally think this will work or this will not work. And, you know, different businesses will accept different models, different outcomes, different experts. You're gonna, it's gonna happen. You're gonna hit the speed bumps. Just be prepared to embrace it and learn from it. I think that's a really, um, key point certainly we work for a lot of sort of large-scale government organizations um, and obviously public money spends it, it, it can feel like a waste but actually longer term you will you will you will get that return of investment because you will have implemented and deployed the most appropriate solution so I think that's it just one sort of final thought on that is that um, alongside a lot of the the, the licensed products and tools and, and some of the market leaders there's some really, really good open source, open source alternatives out there now as well, um, which are getting better and better on a, on a very frequent basis. Um, and there's a really good sort of sense of community in, in 
um, you know, real techies and developers feeding back into those open source products, helping to continually enhance and evolve them, um, sharing new bits and pieces that they've developed out there in, into the ether. So if you are looking to, to kind of start on, on this piece, um, but perhaps with a, a lower level of investment, definitely look into some of the open source tools and products that are available out there because there's some that are really, really good and are definitely starting to, to catch up with, with some of the licensed products as well. So if we could expand on that last point there, for businesses wondering where to begin on their AI journey, if they are thinking about implementing AI or machine learning in their business, where would be the, the best place to start? And what sort, of, what sort of things need to be considered? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the, the, the big one for us, which we, we've, we've touched on quite a lot already this morning, is, is looking at what is your challenge? You know, what, it's not AI for AI's sake. What, what are you actually looking to achieve? And then how will AI as a concept help you get there? Um, the, the other one in my mind is, is very much the data. Um, and, and I know Govind will, will certainly elaborate on this, but all of this stuff is data driven. Every, every single piece of AI and automation comes from the data that sits behind it. So um, your business, your organization, with, without that data, um, it'll be very, very difficult to start. So have a think about what data do you already have that you could use for, for AI to help establish it, to help train it. Um, and, and also what data should you be collecting going forward? Um, and, and we often, we touch on Netflix as the example because I think it's certainly the one that's most re relatable to people and, and things like Spotify is very similar. But when Netflix recommends you a film or a new show to watch, that's all driven by the data that is stored on what you've watched previously. So what was the genre of the film, who was potentially in it, and then it provides the, the recommendations off the back of that. Without that data, it wouldn't be able to do that. So, so really do start to have a think about, one, what data do you already have? And two, going forward, what data will you, will you already need to, to collect? Um, and I guess some of, the, some of the other things in my mind are becoming sort of what I would describe as digitally risk aware. So a lot of businesses will suddenly start to need to be cognizant of risks that they, they probably didn't have previously. So, for example, if you have now introduced a chatbot or a virtual assistant as a means for, for customers to engage with your business, um, and that's something new to you, start to think about, well, you know, what are you going to do then with the data that the, the customer enters into that, that chatbot or that assistant? Is it going to get stored somewhere or is it just going to get thrown away? If it does get stored, is it going to get stored securely? Um, how do you know that the person that your virtual assistant is interacting with is genuinely that person? Um, and there's a lot of risks that kind of come with these things that perhaps an organization um, didn't have to think about before, but, but now does. So there's, there's definitely that, that side of things in, in my mind as well. Yeah, I think if you've got a, a reasonably experienced in-house dev team, then the chances are you can build, you can access AI yourself, or at least test the, the concept out and make sure that what you want to build is buildable. Um, if you don't have an experienced in-house dev team, chances are you're going to have to outsource it. Yeah, I, would, I totally agree with that. I think for the in-house devs, I mean, if you look at the major the major players in the game, they have you know Google, Microsoft. They have they have frameworks and engines, and they have they have they have like training material that you can access to review and read. Um, so definitely, you know, have a look first and try and get your understanding because before you outsource it, outsource it, you want to understand that you know if it's going to meet your demand. And just to reiterate, Helen, GDPR is everybody's best friends at the minute, and it becomes it becomes even more so with data. Um, and the last thing about it is, I think, is the customer side again. Um, if you've got it, if you've got a bit of AI, if you've got a chatbot, you need to make your customers aware that they could potentially be dealing with because you know GDPR says that if you don't want to be, if you don't want a robot to process your claim or your um, purchase, then you don't have to. So you need to be able to handle both. So always in the back of your mind. Things like business continuity are really key. So um, probably I'll try to uh, answer in terms of how businesses can adopt AI, right? Some of that has been covered here. So what does AI actually do? Like if you think about the use cases where uh, I'm going to try and tick off very quickly the different areas that AI can help you in. So very briefly, if you want to break down AI, 
uh, it starts from the level of natural language processing. So anything that is text format, how do you read the text and interpret it and get some sense out of it to act on it? That's that's one level of uh, AI, I think. So you can think of use cases like uh, if lawyers get very complicated documents, how do you quickly send it to an AI mission and get some key summary out of it? What does the document talk about so that someone doesn't have to physically open it and read the document and see what it says about? So that's one use case of it. That's called natural language processing. And then you have the bit called machine learning, where you have some statistical algorithms. Now the point is, uh, the, the goal of these algorithms is twofold. One is either you classify something, so you throw at it different options and it comes out saying that this the input data that you've given me is falls, uh, falling under this specific bucket. So it tries to classify into which genre this is going to belong to. And the other is prediction. Like if you look at the house prices and everything else, just another example, given the data that it has, it can try and predict what's going to happen in the next sequence of time, like uh, your disaster recovery or anything like that. So one is classification and the other is prediction. Now that's more of machine learning, the second bucket. And then you have something called deep learning. Deep learning is like uh, your neural net, something that simulates something similar to your brain architecture. You have neurons, you have multiple layers, you have data flowing from one layer to another layer. So it's, it, it sounds very uh, intensive, but uh, now with the technology that we have, it's, uh, it's become ch becoming cheaper to deploy uh, a neural net and so on and so forth. But these tend to operate with l large volumes of data, uh, unlike uh, other uh, statistical machine learning, which can operate with a little volume of data as well, sometimes. Um, so that's your deep learning bit of it. And finally, you have a fourth umbrella, which is called computer vision, where you can see images, recognize, and act on what source of action you need to take next. So all these four put together, you can sort of think around what is going to be my purpose of using an AI, and what am I trying to solve? And then you need uh, skilled people, um, you need uh, frameworks to support you create that solution, that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so to follow on from the thinking there, are there any industries in particular where AI is being used maybe more than others right now? I think we, we see a surprisingly broad range of applications um, because you'd be amazed at how many different industries day to day have a lot of the same challenges that they're, that they're looking to solve. So for example, for a lot of our clients, um, Rich and his team um, do an awful lot of work around um, using robotics to automate um, manually intensive processes. So data entry, for example, taking data from, from one system or from a physical document and having to enter it into another system was typically a, a role that somebody had had to do manually, um, wasn't particularly enjoyable, was quite monotonous, and, and that's something that's a prime candidate to, to use automation. Um, and it's also quite a, a common theme across, across multiple industries. Um, obviously, you saw from the examples on the slides earlier on that the thing Things like comms, media, and high tech. Um, a lot of this stuff is is prevalent, um, but also in you know healthcare industries now. I think you know f for me that's one of the the biggest benefits of, of this type of work. So being able to use a lot of the techniques that Govin mentioned um, to help with diagnostics. Um, and helping to do initial triage of, of, of diagnosis and things like that and really being able to free up um, the time of a doctor and a physician to, to do that one-on-one -on -one human interaction um, and, and having the, the AI and the, the machines and the systems doing the real heavy lifting of the, of the data analysis. So it, it's quite prevalent now in the, in the healthcare industry. Um, but yeah, as Rich mentioned, we work with a, a lot of um, public sector clients, but also private sector as well, um, a lot in, in finance and, and any companies who are, are dealing with customer interactions. Um, so, so one of my teams at the moment, for example, is, is using some machine learning to deal with um, customer complaints. Um, and, you know, for example, if somebody rings up the business and wants to complain about a service that they have or they, they send in a letter um, starting to use what we call speech to text um, and optical character recognition to translate um, recorded calls and written documents into electronic text that we can then analyze at pace and at volume 
to start to understand what has a customer been in touch about, um, looking at the sentiment of, of what they've said as well. You know, are, are, they, are they really sort of hacked off with the service that they've been given, um, or is it quite a friendly letter? And all of these things start to then inform you with, well, how quickly do I, as, as, as the, the client, need to react to my customer and respond back to them? Is it an urgent issue that I need to deal with, you know, in, in the next couple of days, or is it something that you can kind of put on a longer trajectory? and all of this stuff helps you inform that and, and, and for me that's very much principles that you can apply across industry. Um, there, are, there are quite a lot of examples. I mean, there, there's like um, uh, retail, pharmacy, uh, uh, charities and probably I'll just give one of my, uh, the one that I like most um, and then go with something which is more like a, more like a thrill experience. So uh, the one that I like most is like um, uh, an program called Akshay Patra that Accenture worked on. Uh, it's, uh, it's called, uh, it's a Sanskrit word which means a vessel which keeps giving you food. Uh, that's, that's the name of it. It's an, it's an NGO, non-government organization, uh, non-profit uh, organization. And its purpose is to provide uh, midday meals to people, students uh, across India. And uh, the demographics of it, the sheer volume of population and all the uh, other complexities of uh, Indian demographics makes it even more challenging to precisely predict how much of food will be required in a school at any, at any given point in time. So what Accenture had developed, this, this was a program that was developed by Accenture along with partnership with Akshay Patra and uh, it has the capability to predict the volume of food that is required at a specific school. And uh, they, they have like a network of systems and internet of things that runs behind this so that they can create, they can produce food and they can avoid a lot of wastage in terms of how do they get it from one school to another and everything else. It's, it's very, very well managed and it's been proven very effective in making sure that there is no food wastage and they're able to produce what it does. And um, um, I'm part of uh, something called the charity uh, within Accenture and we were trying to see if we can implement something similar to this within UK because we have like quite a lot of um, food companies like Rex and a few others who, who run these breakfast clubs and everything else. But the power of technology is it can predict and it can help us to manage very well all these charity sort of things. Um, then you have Amazon Go. Uh, it's, it's like an experiment that's being trialed out in US at this point in time. So basically you can walk into a retail store, you can grab stuff and you can walk out. So that gives you a thrill of like you are shoplifting for a minute, you don't have to pay for anything. But the, but the thing is when you grab it, there is there's like uh, computers, uh, yeah, we have, we have like cameras watching us. So uh, when you grab it, it gets canned instantly and it gets added to your wallet. And uh, when you walk out, it just uh, gets detected automatically. That's, that's really cool. So um, there are, and, and the other bit is the uh, medical industry, right? Cancer research. There are like pharmaceutical companies. There is one pharmaceutical company which is heavily investing in AI. And they have done a case study which has proven that a process that took like 10 years to build something for a specific uh, medical problem to treat, could have been built if they reverse engineered the whole process using AI within like uh, six months. So that's humongous cost savings. So um, medical field benefits quite a lot from AI, uh, cancer detection, uh, quite, a, quite a few things we would have uh, we would have listened to the recent news and everything else. So there's quite a bit of intervention that can happen with the AI technologies in the field of medical. I can't really add too much. Um, <laughs> A lot of our clients are really developing a lot of AI solutions, but we signed NDAs, so we can't tell you about them. Um, but what I am really impressed with is just how much is happening up in the northeast at the minute around AI. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think um, obviously we, we see it certainly from an Accenture point of view. I think outside of London, I don't really see anywhere else at scale doing it anywhere in the country other than Newcastle. It's really impressive, and, and hopefully that will bring a lot of the sort of talent and business up, up to the northeast so we can continue to, to grow um, but I kind of just wanted to, to spend a minute talking about we're talking about how you know companies can adopt it but I, I want to talk about like I think where it's going to go because I think the power of AI is going is, is immense um, and there's kind of in my head there's a journey of how it's going to go because in silo every company public or private doing it is great but the, the real power will become when it, it becomes combined and we, 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 we share data and we share you know processes together and, I'll, and obviously, I'm not going to go through my client's customer journey, but a customer journey that I, I imagine if someone from the Northeast, we'll call them rich, we can, we can see if, if, if schools have, you know, have data for his GCSEs or his A-levels, 
and we know that he's failing and we know that social services get involved and they're sharing data and they're sharing data amongst themselves. And then we know that the likelihood, and we can predict because of the journey that Rich has been on in his life, that you know, and he, he goes to young offenders and then he doesn't get a job and he claims benefits and then all of a sudden, you know, he ends up in jail and, and then rehabilitation come in and he does program X, Y, and Z and, he, and then he finally gets rehabilitated. That's a really good journey and we can predict at what point in, in Rich's journey that we could have done some more preventative action. But to be able to do that, we need to collectively come together as, as organizations, private and public. And I think when we get there, we will really be able to change people's lives from a, um, you know, from a society point of view. And I think that's really where it comes, where it's gonna to come together for me. Um, people sharing data and the mass amount of data that we have immersed and, and we, can, we can share collectively across the, the country and, 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 and probably internationally. Um, but companies are going to take a lot of convincing to get there. I think there's a big ethical piece of work going on, and I think Corbin might you know, tell us a little about how the framework's going to look. But I, I really do, and, and I encourage everyone to embrace it, because it, it's going to happen, whether you, whether you want it to or not. So be part of it. Actually, I was uh, just going to touch that last point that you made there. Um, we, we talked about it before, but obviously we, we hear about all the benefits that AI will bring, but there'll naturally be some risks involved as well. One of them that gets a lot of uh, press at the minute is, is the loss of jobs as AI starts to do things that people are paid to do right now. Uh, do you see that as a, as a huge issue or is that a bit of a, a, bit of a myth? I think, it's a, I think it's a bit of both and there's no getting away from it because every, every organization will have a different target. Some will be to maximize revenue, some will be to you know, increase productivity, but I, I, think it's, um, I think it's both. I think it creates opportunity and risk. I think obviously there will be some jobs that will go, but I think the jobs that will, will likely to go for me will be jobs that don't employ the best of humans. I think we need to embrace what, what, what's great about being human and, and, and let the machines do the heavy lifting. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, so I think it's, it, it's, it's both. I think it really is both. So uh, we speak about some guiding principles to implement any AI. One, one of the, speak, uh, one of the uh, things that we focus on is leadership. So this is where the leadership commitment comes in. So any leadership who takes on this AI journey needs to make sure of two things. One is your AI is accountable, made accountable. So you can't let algorithms throw out something and you can't walk away from the implications of it. You would have seen uh, recent news incidents about it and uh, how companies have been trying to scramble to provide an explanation for what happened, whether it was the cause of AI or whether it was a human error. So number one is making AI accountable. So um, uh, we work on something like fairness tool, making sure that there is no bias uh, included within the AI, training data and so on and so forth. But number two is more importantly uh, related to the uh, skills and the jobs that we are speaking about. So we need to make sure that the people or the processes that is in which these people are involved in, we make sure that we find them new roles. And to Rich's point, it's about more of uh, human roles that we find them because even when we have this AI, there are bits of it which needs to be undertaken by us, uh, like explaining the outcomes of what the missions predict. Uh, if the mission is not able to make a decision, we have to step in and make a decision on its behalf. Um, we have to grow it, we have to sustain it, we have to continuously monitor and train it. And most of the time that's saved in these other mundane activities could be focused on rehumanizing uh, more of productive works. That's, that's the way that we see it going. But yeah, unless we have that underlying leadership commitment to make sure that this is done in the right way, we might end up uh, losing jobs. But as AI becomes more ac accessible, surely you get further away from that leadership commitment because like people like me are accessing AI and we don't know about those founding principles. Um, and as it becomes more and more accessible to non-techs, non-geeks, to like CEOs and execs, you get further away from, from that accountability, which is where it started. And how are we going to... Sorry, I'm um, how, how do we maintain those founding ethical principles? Yeah, this is, this is something that's uh, growing now. Uh, there, is, there is an organization which is like overseeing, uh, trying to at least uh, oversee most of the AI developments that's happening on a wide scale, bringing in an ethical framework and making sure that it's getting implemented. So not just, uh, not just organizations per se, but anything that you, uh, if, if a developer goes off and builds an AI, something for his, for his own use or something which is like minimal application, that's, that's fine. We, we don't even get the visibility to it, but anything that is going to be on a wider scale, which is impacting the lives of people, uh, this organization is trying to make sure 
that all the ethical responsibilities are met. It's, it's, it's upcoming. People are talking about it. There is quite a lot of visibility around it. Uh, Accenture has done quite a lot of um, uh, frameworks roll out on this, making sure that there is fairness. We normalize the data and everything else. We don't introduce bias. We don't talk about um, just, just depending on the use case, making sure there is no age discrimination, race discrimination, and few other things. So there's not just that. The, the whole point of this framework is to make sure that there is there's someone watching you, uh, just making sure you're doing the right thing. So. I totally agree and, and just just to add to that you know we will definitely get to a point um, where there will be laws around the the ethical um, in reduction of AI um, ethical and responsible AI is is always hot topics um, there are a lot of government bodies who are already actively looking at this um, and in discussions with a lot of um, key players in the AI industry to almost set up governing boards that help define what those rules regulations and frameworks will be that that AI will have to to adhere to going forward for sure and you know even just things like GDPR which Rich mentioned um, is kind of just the beginning because um, you're quite right as this does become more and more accessible to to each and every one of us there will need to be guiding principles and ultimately laws that, that people adhere to um, and I guess just the, the the final point on the the what will it mean for for kind of human jobs kind of just echo what what all of these chaps have said but it's try to look at it from the point of view of you know we talk about this virtual workforce of human plus machi machine think in terms of it's about freeing up hu human ingenuity to get humans doing what they do best and having machines do what they do best rather than replacing one with the other is is certainly how i try to look at it um so will it necessarily mean a reduction in jobs i'd like to think not but will it mean different jobs absolutely Absolutely, and that, that's kind of the crux of it for me. We've got a question. Hey, it's just on that job, uh, there'll be different jobs, and I, I, I think you're probably onto something there. But if you're one of those people that does one of those repetitive manual tasks whose job is likely to get automated, there's a short term where you will be affected and there will be job losses. They'll be replaced with other jobs which you might not be qualified or capable of doing. So there is still kind of are people right to fear for their jobs? So I, I think fear is a strong word, but obviously there's there's gonna be uncertainty. I think there really is. Um, but if you look at if you look at like, you know, the last hundred years, the Industrial Revolution, we go through these cycles where, you know, we don't we don't work in the, the factories like we used to, you know, we don't have cotton mills. We've moved on and I think this is just the next step in that. So I think, I think again, I'll, I'll go back to the opportunity bit. So yes, there are, there are definitely jobs that, that, that are at risk. Just like when we brought in business processing, people who did data input, a lot of that kind of, kind of went that way. But I think that leads to opportunities. I think they, you know, we, there is an opportunity that we need to train, retrain people and ourselves to, to do the work. That is, that is, that is a guarantee. But I look at I look at the educational piece. So there is a small subset of society that will will um, be impacted, and, and and it's going to be really key to see how that um, how that's managed by by society and by the government and by organisations. But I look at I look at education now, and I see when I was three, I ate mud. I did. I was like, you know, that's what kids did then. But I see I see my my nephew now. He's three, and he he's got an iPad, and he's like he is already far techier than I was up until my teenage years, and I think that's only going to continue to grow. So I think that will then surge more employment from, from that way. Another question as well. Sorry, does that answer? I think you're right that long term it's probably going to take care of itself. But I'm thinking if you're in, a, in an organisation where there are uh, 50 people doing this money process, maybe just two people doing this money process, those specific people are going to lose their jobs and they can't instantly go and find one of these other jobs. Does the organisation have some responsibility here? Yeah, we do have, uh, so, so basically this trend is emerging, uh, we call it um, fusion skills, uh, the, the brand that it goes with is fusion skills. Uh, so the ability of the organization to recognize that there is a need for the people to be trained on new skills which do not exist at the current time of frame, so that's, that's called fusion skills. So what these skills could be like, uh, there, there are like eight to nine different categories of them. One is like, um, how do you continuously reimagine the business process? For instance, from the example that you mentioned, that the person who has been doing the manual work, 
would be best place to say that what that process is and how we can constantly make it more better. So those inputs is falls into a category of how do you, how does that person constantly reimagine business process. This also ties back to how we make sure that these people who are going to be replaced with these processes, how do we elevate them to new roles? And these are the fusion skills, like if the mission, if the algorithm or whatever that is you have put in place fails to make addition, they will be best placed to make addition on its behalf because they know the process in and out. So uh, the ability to recognize there is a gap that we need to bridge in terms of reskilling these people with fusion skills becomes very relevant. And that's something that um, we are sort of um, advocating as well, uh, making sure that it gets people get to acknowledge that. Does it answer? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and and this, is, this is purely my, my just personal opinion, but I think there will always be elements of potential redundancies. That, that's just a fact, and that's nothing new. Right? You know, that's not something that's been brought about by AI per se. That's something that historically, in, in all, across all industries, uh, has happened. You know, companies go up and down. There will be cases where genuinely they're looking at these new technologies because financially they simply have to make headcount reductions, and, and, and sadly that, that's a fact. But in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily about those headcount reductions. It's just about becoming better becoming more efficient and, and, f and getting the better use out of your, your human employees as well. And I think in those in instances, um, there, there is an obligation with a lot of the employers and, and one that actually from, from what I've seen, employers are embracing in terms of putting a support piece around those individuals and around those roles that says, yes, actually, we are going to use some of these tools and tech to, to make what you were doing more, more efficient, um, free of, of human error that, that creeps into these processes. But equally, we're going to support you hand in hand to help develop these new skills and help you identify another area of the business that, that you, where you can really go and add value um, and I think as I say certainly from what I've seen there's a lot of companies and organizations that are very much putting that support structure in place rather than simply going it's about replacing a person with a machine. Mm -hmm. Sorry can I just quickly follow up that? In those examples where that happens that sounds great how do people find out about that because I think that's where the people who are who this is being done to it's going to depend on the person. So you're going to get two flavors of it, right? You're genuinely going to get some people who kind of go, I don't want any part of that. No, this robot's taking my job. I don't want to know. I'm going to leave anyway. What you actually see more of is the people who actually go, fantastic, I am so sick to death of this data entry role. My company is now going to pay for me to upskill in something that I find really interesting, where I feel like I'm coming to work and adding genuine value every day, doing something different every day. Um, and a lot of people have really responded quite positively to it because it means um, quite an exciting opportunity for them. As I say, though, equally, there will always be people who react the other way, and I think that it's probably true of, of most things. So it sounds like the amount of fear that people are going to feel is directly related to who their boss is or who the leadership of the country is. So, um, so there's, there's also a bit of perspective here, right? Uh, we, we tend to look at it as a bad thing, but there are some jobs that people want to move away from. For instance, there are some jobs in terms of content viewing and uh, content reading and uh, looking, reading at, even, even looking at uh, the different communications that come for different organizations. Let's say it's a health organization and people open that and constantly read through that. They, they read through the, the information which is not so pleasant and it depresses them. As a human, it generally depresses them. So imagine, or, or you might have heard about um, YouTube and Facebook where people have to watch videos and they have to make a decision whether this can be allowed or not. That, that's like real people doing that job, right? So. Um, Imagine the psychological trauma that they will have to go through in order to get to that point of filtering the videos or filtering the content. And imagine a mission doing it. Um, the person is going to be glad to perform a superior role there rather than having to see that. So there's a bit of perspective as well as to what is that we are getting rid of. So it's, it's always not going to be, yes, agreed, but that's where we, have, we are speaking about the fusion skills and everything else. But there, is, there are elements where it's going to be more of a beneficial thing in nature. I think looking at it from an accounting uh, side of things, there's a lot of uh, software that's being developed for um, you know, the, the guys in the office who are doing mileage claims, expenses, um, and there's a lot of software out there that now can check 
multiple entries to make sure tax codes are correct or you know all the relevant information's in there. Now, that's great and it's a great sanity check, but I think there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of weight to skin a cat in accountancy and there's a lot of knowledge and experience that that person who actually does input the information into the system knows and understands. But actually having the AI in place to ultimately reduce that human error, but to, to also have that check in place is, is ultimately going to become more efficient for the accountant company and um, the, the clients themselves. What's interesting is, is when the AI can actually under, have that level of knowledge itself. And I, I'm quite curious myself, asking the panel how far away that potentially is of actually having an AI that could have an, a, a level of, you know, a, a lawyer's knowledge or uh, an experienced accountant's knowledge. You know, how far away is it before that kind of becomes a, a, a thing? I mean, I'll let Govan get into the, the, the crux of the detail of the math, but I think a, a lot of it for me is, is risk and probability. How much risk are you willing to accept against the probability of the outcome? You know, is is 85% enough for you to be happy if it's a yes, no? If it's a, you know, is this a cancer cell? 85% probably isn't good enough. You know, it should be 99, but, you know, is this a complaint? 85% is probably fine, you know, in triage it down the line. So I think probability and risk is is where I would I would define that. So Coven, I don't know if you want to... Yeah, um, in the, in the uh, AI world, uh, there, there are different ways of measuring uh, how accurate your missions are going to be. So um, very, very... very uh, brief example would be they call it precision versus recall, uh, one of the very features, important features. So in medical world, you might want to make sure that every time you make a prediction, it needs to be right prediction, right? So you don't want to uh, misclassify someone who's not having an illness as someone having an illness. That's, that's, if, if you do that, then it's okay because um, that person might be diagnosed for something and they, they might do that. But if you misclassifying a person who is really sick as as someone who is healthy, then that's a, that's a disaster. So, uh, in other in other worlds, it doesn't it might not matter. So, if you're trying to something which is more uh, less significant, it might be okay if you get the wrong prediction. So, there are quite a lot of parameters that goes into this uh, as to what purpose it's serving for, and the way that it works out is we have the models, we have everything, we have the confidence rates of uh, how it's predicting it, and based on that, we make a decision. Um, that's how it's built, and. Um, Actually, in reality, what happens is we never, uh, at least at the implementations that we have seen, there is, uh, there's nothing like where the mission makes autonomous decisions. It's always uh, intercepted by a human. So it augments human to provide a right decision rather than it making a decision. That's the key difference to note. So it looks at the data, it provides valuable insights, and then someone clicks the button that says, yes, do this or do that. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting because uh, I think... Um we must, we're still at a stage now where AI is only as good as the data that it's analyzing and the parameters it's given by humans. Um, it, it, I suppose the, the real fear is, is that next stage is when it, it can analyze its own data and it can, you know, it can get rid of the rubbish, but then it can create, create its own parameters. So just... uh, seed legals already exist. Um, it's automating, it's already automating part, part part of the, um, the legal process. So Deb McGoggle from the Northeast um, and Anthony Rose have built an uh, automated process for a specific part of the, the legal uh, system. A question over there. Phil um, Rich, uh, Ascension. Um, I'm, I'd be interested to hear what activity uh, Ascension's seen on the ground in the Northeast that leads you to believe that outside London that Newcastle is leading the way in terms of AI. That's a, that's a huge claim. If that's the case, we should be dining out on that. So I'm just curious what you've seen that says that over Edinburgh and Cambridge and Oxford and Manchester, Newcastle is the place. So I, I, see, I see the clients. I see our clients around the United Kingdom coming, and I see the expanse of Accenture's advanced technology. Um, we've had a, I think we went from three, 300 to 800 people. We've, we've, we've recruited heavily, heavily into our intelligent engineering services capability, which is robotics and artificial intelligence, uh, data science. Um, we've taken on numerous new clients. Uh, we've got, I speak to clients from, and other um, suppliers who, who are feeling the same sort of trajectory that come on. I see our universities and I see our um, apprenticeship schemes very much tailored around this. Uh, and I, and I, I genuinely get that vibe. I, I work a lot in the Midwest, uh, in the Manchester region. I think everyone's, everyone's starting to dabble in it, but I think from a, from a skill based, I really do see, I really do see the growth in, uh, in Newcastle. 
Rich mentioned uh, the the work around the the universities that we've got in the northeast and apprenticeship programs. Um, obviously, Accenture's got a, a really thriving apprenticeship program in Newcastle, but very other um, a lot of other um, organisations, sorry, as well with with equally as good programs in the northeast, which, which is fantastic. Um, new all of the work that Newcastle University is doing with the the kind of national um, innovation centre for data, which is all linked to this kind of work. That's all happening in the northeast. Um, we work daily, or, or certainly. I work daily with um, Accenture colleagues who, who work in AI down in London, um, and, and and you know I think they would they would say a lot of the same things. And in, in the work that we're doing up here in the northeast is fantastic. And, and myself and, and these guys are often called upon to go in and speak with with different clients across Accenture UK to tell them about the story of the, the successes that we've seen in the northeast. Um, so you know to Rich's point, there's fantastic stuff happening in London and things as well. We're certainly not the only ones, but we are absolutely absolutely blazing the trail across northeast industries and you know look at startups with like kevin things like this and the work that they're doing it's it's phenomenal actually i just wanted to quickly touch on that that point with the with the startups and change the focus a little bit kev you, you're building a, a product in the ai machine learning space do you see a lot of opportunities for other businesses to build products in that space as well or is it becoming a, a quickly saturated market you mentioned seed legals before it's obviously yourselves as there's other businesses, are there opportunities across many different sectors for anyone that's thinking about starting up a business in that space? Yeah, I think any business which is process driven, um, it's, it, it can be replaced with a machine learned process. Um, so, there, I mean, there's a lot of AI turning up in accountancy and in legals. Um, we're obviously focusing on sales processes. Um, so, yeah, there's opportunities there. Uh, I guess it just depends. It, it goes back to the start where you've got to find the problem. You're not just building a yeah. an I AI mean, product. For us, we, we knew what area we wanted to be in. We didn't necessarily think... We, we didn't decide we would solve it with AI. Um, we, in fact, because it was such a buzzword, we deliberately took all mentions of AI and machine learning out of our pitches because there was a, a pushback okay. against that from investors. Um, it just turns out that AI is the correct solution for what we're doing because it's in natural language processing and that's like the, the base, like the, the beginnings of AI. And I guess, uh, Joe, from, from your perspective, are you seeing a lot of AI companies develop in the region who are coming to you or outside the region? Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, a lot within the region. Um, I think we're dealing with about four or five companies at the minute and the, the, the spread of how AI is being implemented in different industries is it's really interesting yeah um, I guess that the, the final point I think would be great I think we've touched on it slightly but if, if the panel could give me and everyone an idea of where you see AI going in the next five years um, if we Everywhere. can keep it relatively short we are running very quickly out of time but just a, a quick overview of where you see things going in the next few years so I think I think I tried it too before. I think I think everywhere is probably the easiest word to describe it. Um, but I think if we go like my journey of Rich the Torag and to get rehabilitated, I think sharing that data, sharing those experiences, sharing our capability cross government, cross uh, private sector, um, I think that's where it'll go. Um, the just the one I wanted to go back to on the Newcastle. Thing, I think I think Newcastle will be leading the way. Um, I think as as data sensitive as it is for everyone, and, and companies want to try and keep more things on shore, and things like Amazon and Azure and the cloud be more readily available in the UK, I think people will want to develop in the UK, and I think they'll want to develop it develop at a, a at a premium, and I think we can do that in Newcastle because I think our cost to serve rate is 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 lower than London. You know, rent isn't as much, and salaries aren't as much, and all of that other good stuff leads to just a really um, a really great future for for AI and and in just development and growth across. Across the northeast, um, it's it's just gonna grow because um, I think the growth that we had on AI has been happening over the last uh, six to seven years. Uh, the processing power, the data, fundamental things that's been uh, thriving this growth, and uh, we are not gonna stop using mobile phones or putting our data out there. I think we are going to do it a lot more. Uh, so I think it's 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 just gonna grow. Uh, the power of data is gonna make it grow. As the ill-educated here, I, I think nuclear apocalypse. <laughs> I think it's a difficult one because I think the tech, the tech will grow faster than the legislation and the ethical debate and the privacy debate. Um, 
So there's going to be a lot of a lot of questions asked after the fact. So technology will get there, and then we'll be railing back, going, "But what if we get Alexa to phone the police if it hears uh, issues of domestic violence?" Like that kind of things out there. The technology is available right now. Um, I think. I mean, even in in sales, depending at which point you put artificial intelligence within the sales process, changes culture. So if I put it at the point of buying, so it makes the buying decisions, then all of a sudden you're removing perception of value. So you've got a, a machine that goes, that's worth X amount. So the actual value becomes the actual value, which isn't the case in sales. Um, so all marketing decisions then get changed behind that. So it's going to depend on a lot of individual uh, powerful people's decisions on where they place the tech. Um, so you've got the likes of Amazon, who are now in everyone's home, uh, the majority of people's homes, who are going to get to decide very specific things about this ethical debate before anyone else gets to say. Yeah, I think just just kind of final, final point on that, not just in terms of where the tech will go in five years, but I think that the point you mentioned around culture is a, is a really interesting one. I think we'll see as much cultural shift and swing as, as we will with the tech. You know, we've talked about how the nature of jobs will change, so we'll see a lot more machine learning engineers, we'll see a lot more data scientists roles, which are already on the increase. I think in five years' time, they will, they will only get higher and higher. Um, and just people's views around AI generally, I think we, we're seeing it on an annual basis becoming far more commonplace, for, far more accessible, and a, and a lot less scary than I think it's probably been in, in, in five or 10 years um, past. So I think there's definitely, you know, the cultural shift that we'll see as well as the, the technology trends as well. Great. Well, uh, conscious of the time, I think that's a great place to, to wrap up the panel this morning. Um, so please can everyone show the panelists uh, their appreciation for their time this morning. A special thanks goes to Accenture for partnering with us this morning. Thank you for having us. Um, and to Luma for their continued support of the Converge platform as well. Thank you. Um, We've still got the space until 10.30, so if anyone does want to continue networking and ask more questions, we didn't, I'm sure we could have sat here for about three hours having this debate. Um, so if you've got any more questions, I'm sure these guys would be more than happy to answer them. Um, and until, uh, yeah, until about half past 10. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and then enjoy the rest of your days, whatever you're doing.